Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dominic Wong Weekend Show, where we have grassroots conversations about current affairs. In conjunction with World Pride Month, today we have Brian Chia, who is Research Assistant for Drug Policy and Criminal Policy at a prominent local think tank. He was pre previously a Communications Officer at Amnesty International. Thank you for spending your time today with us. Um, before we start, I would like to cover some of the terms used by the LGBT community. Um, for example, LGB means um, lesbian, gay, bisexual. These are sexual orientation terms to denote a person's sexual orientation. Where else for T and sometimes I as well, that means transgender and intersex. These are where some people, they have gender identity that do not correspond with their biological sex traits or people who might have both men or women sex traits. Uh, without further ado, Brian, would you like to introduce your background and your advocacy and LGBT movement in Malaysia? Hi, Dominic. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, thanks for the flattery, by the way, LGBT activism. Um, uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brian. I am currently a research assistant on um, at a research center. My portfolio is to do with drug policy and prison reform. Uh, previously, I was with Amnesty International Malaysia as their comms officer. Um, so yeah, my work with uh, LGBT activism, so to speak, comes from that line of work as well as uh, just personal passion. Thank you. Um, so we should start with the first question. Um, what is the legal position of LGBT persons in Malaysia? How do we fare as a country regionally? Is homosexuality illegal per se in Malaysia? Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. So I, I think the position on homosexuality in Malaysia is actually a lot more complicated than we think, right? So let's just start with the basics. Um, the criminal code in Malaysia is governed by Section 377A of the Penal Code. So that the Penal Code dictates what are crimes and what isn't. And Section 377A defines uh, carnal intercourse against the order of nature. So that includes oral sex, anal sex, and basically the sex acts that we associate with uh, homosexuality. But that doesn't mean the Penal Code punishes homosexuality specifically, because oral sex and anal sex can be performed by heterosexual couples. Uh, in fact, lawyers have noted that the application of this act in terms of uh, persecuting people for a crime has really only, uh, has mostly been used for persecuting uh, sexual offenses. So that includes sexual harassment and rape. Uh, that involve elements of intercourse against the order of nature. Um, the penal code applies to Muslims and non-Muslims, but Muslims have are also governed under Sharia. And under Sharia, there are uh, provisions dealing with this matter as well. So uh, same-sex sexual acts under Sharia are known as liwat and musahakat for men and women, respectively. These acts are criminalized under Sharia law. In fact, there was a high-profile case back in 2019 or 2020, I can't remember, where a, a group of men were, Malay men, because uh, Muslims, were, uh, arrested and charged in Sharia court, uh, they were, yeah, they were arrested at an orgy. Yes. yes. Yeah, so I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, the very feature, the very innate feature of homosexuality within a person is actually not subject to criminalization. I think a lot of people get that confused. Uh, this means if, let's say, someone overhears you mentioning that you are a homosexual and they report you to the police, you can't actually be prosecuted because an actual action needs to be taken. Uh, it needs, an actual action needs to have happened before you are subject to the law. So that's going back to the uh, carnal intercourse against the order of nature and so on and so forth. Yes, um, just for everyone's benefit, uh, Malaysia is 60% Muslim and 40% uh, non-Muslim. So we are governed by a dual track um, secular and also Islamic personal laws. So a dual track uh, court system in Malaysia. Um, so penal code applies um, federally to Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Um, the penal code of Malaysia was, I, th I think, formulated in 1936. 1936, so it's been a long time. It's been replicated from the Indian penal code as well, from 1860. 
Yeah, totally. I think there are, I think, 550 sections. I think it's a 550. In Perry Patu, that's a quite a lot. Yeah, there are many offenses in the country, apparently. Yes, I agree with you, Brian. I think that is not, um, I think, sexual relations in Malaysia for homosexual people. And, and as well for heterosexual people, in terms of oral sex and carnal intercourse, as you mentioned, you know, sex applies to both people. So uh, these are illegal, but homosexuality is not illegal per se. Uh, yeah. Something to add to you, what you said, right? I think Section 28, I think the... I think Section 28 applies to the, what the Sharia, Sharia enactment, Sharia criminal enactment. In, and that is governed by federal law as well, actually. The maximum punishment for Sharia courts in Malaysia is based on a 1965 statute. I think it stipulates a maximum of 5,000 ringgit fine, three years jail, and six whips, six times of whipping. So this is the maximum threshold that states can legislate for Sharia offences in Malaysia. Yeah, so I think that's the position that we have covered in terms of a the two the door track system in Malaysia. So following next, um, modern LGBT movement started in Stonewall riots in 1969 in New York. Um, a lot of people have mentioned is LGBT agenda in Malaysia a Western import? Uh, we encourage social decay. Is it contrary to Malaysian cultural norms? <laughs> yeah, this is the question you hear a lot. Um, the answer is no, no to both of those questions. Um, it is not a Western import, it does not encourage any sort of social decay. Um, and in fact, gender identities and behaviours that today would be categorised as LGBT have been around in Malaysia for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and maybe across many different Asian countries for a very long time. Uh, they're part of our history, a pre-colonial history, you know, a, a history that's been systematically erased because not many people know about these yeah do you have any examples of um lgbt peoples in malaysian history rooted in southeast asia yeah um uh i'm you were going to talk to me about this later but like um based on small bit of research that i did uh there have in the malay archipelago the islands in the in our region there have been sort of uh people such as the uh, manang bali um, who are essentially sort of like healers who transcended the male and female gender binary. Um, and uh, it was the act of sort of like crossing the threshold, men becoming women, I'm um, not sure if it's vice versa, that uh, made the, that were that were that made society around them regard them with sort of respect, right? And then you also had the Sida Sida, the people who uh, these were um, also gender non-conforming people who were basically, you know, courtesans and uh, and held important positions within the sultanates and the palaces. Um, and you know, and here's a fact that might shock the audience: um, there were even designated homosexual villages around uh, Malaysia, um, in Kelantan of all places, uh, very near the Sultan's castle. And these were recorded to be there for until as late as 1960. And um, the communities around them knew about these homosexual, homosexual villages and in fact, even patronized them because, patronized them as in were their patrons because these homosexual villages were homes of um, performers, dancers and um, singers. So the Sultan of Kelantan actually at that time was a patron of these homosexual villages as well. So it's not, a Western import. It's not an oddity of some sort. It's a long part of Malaysia's history. Yes, you mentioned Sida Sida. I think I've read a article that you have wrote previously in Imagine Malaysia entitled "A Reexamining Malaysia's Rainbow History." Um, so you have mentioned Sida Sida there as well. So as from what you say, they they hold a high and important role. I think it's almost like a Brahmin role. So they function as a spiritual mediator for the community. They also uh, work in the, as a courtesan, as you mentioned, uh, in the heart of the royal palace. They hold royal regalia. They conduct official ceremonies. Yes. So I think yeah. I think what happened here was that um, we had a third gender that has been always prominent in Malaysian society, whereas colonization in Malaysia has actually brought their standing, social standing, from one that has been performing social roles of healing for the community one that has a host royal regalia and official functions in the palace, the one that is 
always discriminated in Malaysian society today. Yeah. Uh, do you agree Basically. with that? Is, um, do you have any research um, that you've conducted both by Amnesty International and at your current think tank regarding LGBT issues? Uh, um, mm, no, not really. I would say that uh, when I was at Amnesty International, the issues I primarily dealt with were very uh, contemporary and very human rights centered. Right? So this was just about um, preserving the rights of LGBT people, ensuring the government doesn't persecute or, um, you know, uh, uh, the work I did with Amnesty International was very public facing campaign, sort of putting pressure on the government not to discriminate or oppress uh, queer people. And with my current role, um, I, I haven't had much experience with LGBT people as well. But like I said, um, a lot of my work has to do with drug policy and that is inadvertently usually mixed up with a conversation about HIV AIDS. So there is some relation there. Um, yeah, and you brought up uh, my research essay I did with Imagine Malaysia. So I think that was sort of uh, the most research I had done on the subject uh, before this. Um, do you want me to give a background on that as well? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, Imagine Malaysia is an organization that conducts alternative histories of um, Malaysia and Southeast Asia. They very graciously provided me the opportunity to contribute an essay to one of their publications in 2019. Um, yes. For that, I wrote um, an essay on the, re on the history of queer identities in Malaysia and how the persecution of queer people in Malaysia came to be. So as uh, Dominic, you and I have just, we're just talking about it. History tells us that um, people who were gender non-conforming and did not identify with the construct of the gender binary existed for ages and ages ago. So within that essay, I briefly explored multiple factors that could have led to the Malaysia that we know now. That is very blatantly queer phobic, such as British colonial era laws, uh, Sharia law, and the role of Islam in forming these uh, societal perceptions. Uh, but my analysis was predicated on the concept of an invented tradition in which a piece of history and culture was intentionally formed uh, by those in power for their own gain. So this analysis actually brought me to the conclusion that queer phobia in Malaysia cannot accurately be described as the product of religious teaching from either Christianity or Islam, but was rather propagated by the Malay um, Ethno-Nationalist Party in the 1980s in order to win the Malay vote. And my research also uh, noted a correlation that uh, this may have been done in order to curry favor with like Middle Eastern nations who at the time saw queerness as a Western degeneracy. So I think uh, essentially queer people were used as scapegoats for political gain. And that sort of leads back to our, you know, the history of queerness in Malaysia and like, you know, how can queer phobia exist when we have had such a long history with uh, queer people in Malaysia. Yeah. Yes. I think a lot of people, when they talk about a uh, history of LGBT persons in Southeast Asia, they used to quote a lot of William Pellet. I think he wrote a book yes. called <laughs> Gender Pluralism. Uh, in Gender Pluralism. That was yeah, it. Yeah, I cited that book. Early modern history. So that's like the 1500s until today. And then they talk about even um, multiple genders that exist in Southeast Asian societies. Correct. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the Bisu Bisu, for example, I think that's a key one. So there are five genders in the Boogie society. So Chalabai, and then, um, yeah, so heteronormative men, female, and then those who do not necessarily conform, but are predominantly men and female, and then transgender. So that's the Bisu. And then the Bisu, apparently, like they conduct ceremonies as well for the Sultan, like you mentioned, like you've mentioned in Malaysia. So they're in the same in Bukis as well. They, in Sulawesi, they conduct religious pseudo, like royalty, royal, um, as well as social functions. Like, I think it's just symptomatic of all the different cultures in Southeast Asia. I think he also mentioned that in Dayak and Iban culture, um, some of their gods are androgynous as well. They do not have genders. Yeah. Some of the gods. So I think this is a narrative that goes around the whole of Southeast Asia that has been Hindu, Buddhist, and um, which some of the earliest gods in these religions tend to be androgynous. 
And then this has played on society. I also read one piece of his work. I think it was um, Frank, Frank Swettenham. Frank Swettenham was a resident. Then he became a high commissioner. But he realized there was a pawang, a pawang, a spiritual healer in Para. And then the royalty engaged this pawang to help with the ailment of the late Sultan of Para. So he was mentioning this. This was a trans man, a woman in men's clothing. So like back what you said about the Sida Sida, all of yeah. the different social functions and roles, place them in a high society in uh, Southeast Asia and Malaysia in particular. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, these are like amazing examples and I think there's so many you can find. So I think that, you know, for, I, I think for people who are involved in sort of like queer activism or interested in the subject, um, this is with relation to what you brought up about the Stonewall riots. We cannot, I think, as an Asian society and as as an Asian society with an extensive history that predates Stonewall, like I think a lot of how we frame LGBT activism cannot come from that view as well of like, oh, Stonewall, because our history is more extensive than that, you know? We shouldn't be uh, sort of locking ourselves into the categorizations made uh, within that context. So like, even when you talk about like, even when we talk about non-binary gender identities, right? Like it assumes that the binary came first and then uh, there was a the non-binary, but really there's just multiples, you know, uh, it's all equal to the other. The point I'm trying to make is sort of like, we shouldn't be caught up in like the Western terminology where there's so much here for us to learn and there's so much that we can take from we shouldn't be forming our idea of LGBT activism around that framework. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you as well. I think we have a lot of local culture as well as Western culture that we can hopefully adapt and um, increase our consciousness of Malaysian society about uh, gender and sexuality, which I yeah. think is uh, sorely lacking in Malaysian public and state school systems. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Gosh. But just for everyone's benefit, I think the Stonewall riots was regarding a um, gay inn in Greenwich Village, and then apparently the police tom the, the the bar, and then they arrested some people. So I think the LGBT community in New York were facing a lot of persecution in the 60s, and then it led up to this uh, movement whereby when the police um, raided this inn, you know that their focal in their community, their only community space, they they rioted, and then that's when it started. And then the other. I think the person who was credited was Marsha B. Johnson. She's a Marsha B. Black, Johnson, black trans activist, right? Yes, and uh, uh, you cannot also leave out. Um, I can never pronounce her name correct. Stormy De La Verie. Uh She's a. Uh, uh, she's also another prominent person who was um, on the scene at that site. Uh, she's a, a black lesbian woman. So you know, let's not leave out the important yeah, people. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, the start of it all, I suppose. When I, I guess um, the United States started taking queer rights seriously. And I think that provided a paradigm, for better or for worse, that provided a paradigm shift for the rest of the world. Hence why we're talking about it now, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I also saw a picture recently, um, Malaysian and Singapore lesbian for equality. They were, I think in the 1990s, they had a protest in San Francisco, in San Francisco as well. So I think we have, um, I think America has a small connection with us whereby they had a burgeoning LGBT rights movement and people who studied abroad actually absorbed some of these ideas that they could um, reflect on and contemplate in Malaysian society. Like um, the last person I think I would like to mention is Harvey Milk. He was a board, was counselor, I think board of supervisors. He commissioned someone um, to, I think, design the LGBT flag that you have, the rainbow flag that was used oh, in 1978, yeah. 1978, San Francisco Pride. So I think these are a few things that maybe we can... Um, we definitely have a longer history. We definitely have a longer history in terms of LGBT everyday history, people going through their average lives. But yeah. um, I think this part of the history where the modern LGBT movement, I think some of the Malaysians will benefit from listening or knowing where it comes from as well. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. It's shared experience, I get, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So before we move on to the next question, I think we'd like just to make a general statement of all the, the status of LGBT rights in the world. I think we have some 200 countries currently, and um, 29 of them have legalized um, same-sex marriage. Um, 70 of them has criminalized um, 
same-sex relations. So Malaysia is one of those countries, part of that 70. And then nine countries um, stipulate the death penalty for homosexuals. So that's the state of LGBT rights globally. So Malaysia, in uh, maybe if you put in the rank of four, we are number three. Yes, number three. So much work to be done. So maybe uh, moving on to our next question, what are some of the challenges faced by the LGBT community in Malaysia, topically speaking? Yes. Oof, darn. Um, yeah, you know, name any challenge that affects any minority group and queer people have definitely faced that to a certain degree, right? So there's a lot we can speak on on this, there's so much, you know, um, as a general statement, queer people face, you know, difficulties, a bit more difficulties, I would say, you know, as compared to heterosexual or cisgendered people. Um, having to stay closeted for one can be very mentally draining in and of itself. Yes. Having to live in fear of the consequences should they be outed. You know, it's been quite well documented that uh, so, uh, occurrences of mental illness are far more prevalent in uh, queer people. Um, and queer people who choose to come out of the closet, they also face um, workplace discrimination. They're not given equal opportunity. They may have difficulty finding housing if, um, let's say, people choose not to like rent out to them because they know that they're queer because of existing stigma. If they lived in communities and within families that aren't accepting of their identity, you know, they don't have a support system, they face hostility and aggression. Maybe their families even disown them, you know. Uh, this is definitely something that I think rings very true, especially here uh, in Malaysia. Uh, I think it's also really important to highlight that not all challenges faced by queer people are um, the same, are equal. You know, I think we have to mention trans people, particularly trans women, are in a far more precarious situation than the rest of us. Trans women are far more likely to be brutalized, sometimes till death, not even sometimes, like oftentimes uh, trans people are more likely to be killed. Um, they are also more likely to be subject to sexual abuse and rape, um, far more than, you know, you or I, or, you know, maybe like, uh, or cisgender queer people. Uh, trans women have more stigma attached to them. People always assume that they're drug users, sex workers, which makes it so much more difficult for them to seek help from uh, law enforcement, even when their lives depend on it, you know? Uh, I think in terms of talking about the struggles of queer people, we also cannot leave out the class factor. A queer person from the B40 group who lives paycheck to paycheck, has little to no financial support, has to worry so much more about the consequences of queer phobia as compared to a queer person from a middle to upper class background you know if you have finances if you have savings you don't have to worry about losing your job because you're queer you don't have to worry about being evicted because you're queer and you can afford the mental health services that help you cope with life much better like even within the queer community these experiences and struggles have different levels and should never be uh, generalized I totally agree with you. Um, you. I think you have mentioned so many areas like mental health, healthcare, education, how their family treats them. Um, I think the discrimination or the marginalization felt by LGBT people uh, are wide ranging and it starts from cradle until even your death or coffee. Yeah. Yes, actually, when you were born, you know, when you go to school, you socialize and then um, you, you'll be, I don't know, singled out by your peers for being different after puberty and sometimes maybe your school teachers um they also call you out so they're not an ally so they're actually against you so your peers your teachers your principals your family who are not approving and then um you go to you go to schools the curriculum teaches you that you um sin and guilt and what you are you cannot be yourself so i think it's wide ranging even if you go to workplace and you continue on through your life it is actually compounding so yeah. i think some people who never you know, engage an LGBT person, never walk one day in her, he, their pair of shoes. I mean, we will not understand like, how deep-rooted this um, feeling is. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we are the product of our upbringing and the product of um, the environment around us. So the things that you've mentioned and that we have just talked about, these are just, uh, these are external. Like, half the battle is the self-hatred. 
and you know the desire to be a part of the common individual because society has um, demonized queer identity so much so that uh, many queer people demonize um, themselves and you know like these have real world consequences it's, uh, despite uh, I'm sorry I mean besides the mental health experiences many queer people uh, will face dysfunction in their interpersonal relationships with other people because of this self-doubt this self-hatred people who are closeted for life end up in heterosexual marriages that they resent for their entire lives so yeah these are some of the internal factors you know how can we fix some of these um, internal factors that you mentioned is it regarding education how can um, families how can education improve in helping internally how lgbt people feel about self in terms of uh, low self with i think basically low self-esteem and lot of social pressure to conform yeah yeah no I, I think education is important um and i guess there's different levels to what you mean by education right we can talk about formal education or we can also talk about sort of like education conducted at home informal education which is just as important or even like arguably more important so uh you know, there needs to be, first and foremost, before you talk about self-love and self-confidence, there needs to be a removal of like stigmatizing language and stigmatizing, um, yeah, stigmatizing language and, and just uh, implied stigma that we perpetuate in our day-to-day -day lives without even, you know, realizing when you see a, a cross-dresser in public, some people might have a knee-jerk reaction to go like, ew, like it's things like that. It's small things that, many people may not latch on to, but to the child who is questioning themselves and coming into a new, uh, uh, discovering themselves in a new way or in a new light, new identity, that may leave an impact on them for a long while, you know? And then of course, we're talking about like maybe formalistic education, things, uh, matters that pertain to um, queer people, sex education, you know, that's such an overused term, but sex education. Yes, exactly. Great. That's when you education. don't shy away from the idea of queer people having sex in ways that aren't strictly heteronormative and when you know then these ideas don't become alien because when they become alien they are either feared hated or treated with disgust so yes these ideas need to be brought to the mainstream i think sex education in malaysia is restricted to basic biological process maybe menstruation and there's nothing a lot spoken about um healthy relationships whether like it's a uh, heterosexual or homosexual relationship there's not much about birth control different type of contraceptives beyond just the condom or vagina condom or there's no talk about sexual orientation it's totally not talked about there's no talk about stds and safe sex i think there's um a lot of things that we don't have in uh, sexual and reproductive health curriculum in Malaysia. And then something that is contrary, apparently University of Science of Malaysia, they conducted a workshop. So one of the organizations uh, conducted a back to fitra workshop. So that's like back to nature. It's uh, for LGBT people. So that's the kind of um, education. So that, that, that's the nature and theme of our cultural debate in Malaysia currently, back to nature and also just a biological process for sex education. How do we, uh, what, do you have, what are your comments? <laughs> Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> I think even the comments you made about sex education right before this, I think those were very generous already in regards to the Malaysian context. Very bold of you to assume that people talk about condoms at all, except in passing in the Malaysian educational system. Like I went through SPM, like, okay. I didn't hear anything about it. Um, with regards to the cultural debate about returning to nature, that's so grounded in just pseudoscience, you know what I mean? There's nothing, there's nothing to support it. It's an invented concept created by people who think they know what they're talking about and then um, imposed on poor unfortunate souls. Uh, and it's cool that you brought it up because I'm suddenly reminded, um, I'm sure you remember this because you're around my age, but if you remember around 2013, uh, the government had a small time program where they were rounding up effeminate boys and putting them into boot camps to teach them to be real men. It's tantamount to conversion therapy, basically, which is another one of those horrible things that happens to queer kids in Malaysia. 
but yeah, it, none of it is grounded in science. Like, how do you properly scientifically define that uh, because you were born with male reproductive organs, you have to act a certain way? There is no, there's no scientific grounding. And if there is, it's very shallow. It's based on a lot of conjecture. Uh, so yeah, that's a big gap of what's missing is just a refusal to adapt, I would say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned, yeah, I think religious conversion has been in the news for some time. I think Amnesty International uh, reported in the country report for 2021. I think there was an LGP activist. Her name is Nicole Fong. She's, um, she shared infographics uh, regarding religious therapy, religious conversion therapy in Malaysia. Um, however, I think the other side, the opponents on the other side, um, they usually, on this side, we will say that this is pseudoscience. And then people on the religious right, they will come out with a religious belief that these are unnatural. As well as also the legal position taken in Malaysian law, I think for sex change, for a court order to have a sex change, because Malaysia's system for changing your legal gender is judicialized. You can't go to the National Registration Office and change your gender. You need to see a medical personnel, you need to go to court. And then apparently you have to make four criteria. And this is based on a 1970s case in the UK. It's called Corbett and Corbett. Lah. So that's whereby you need to, the, the court must ascertain four criteria before uh, allowing a legal change in recognition, and that is chromosomes, gonads, yeah, chromosomes, gonads, uh, hormones, estrogens, and uh, secondary sex characteristics. So I think it's a four. Yeah, so this this four have been the basis of legal recognition in Malaysia. The, what are your comments? Do you have any friends, like what you mentioned just now, not just transgenders, but maybe LGB community as well. Like, oh, any real stories from the grassroots of friends having um, for the benefit of the public who might be heterosexual, who did not understand or did not know that some people are facing this. What are your friends' experiences in discrimination, all of them, that are notable? Uh, oh, where, to, where do you even start? Gosh. Um, misgendering is pretty common, you know. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, misgendering is when somebody addresses you in gender terms that you do not identify with. Um, and accidental misgendering is fine, I suppose, but when you're intentionally misgendered, that's when it is quite awful because it's a denial of your very basic identity. Um, some of my friends have been subject to uh, physical assault, um, you know? So, well, I can't think of a particular example right now, but like, it, it's just the common things that you see very often, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I can't think of any particular example right now. <laughs> do, you, do you have any uh, friends who are suffering bullying in school for their sexual orientation or gender identity? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, have yeah, any yeah. of them having problem access to healthcare or access to education or having like suicidal thoughts do you have any friends who suffered any of these uh, things? Yeah, I would say some of them did. Uh, I'm not quite sure about medical because I've, uh, uh, I don't think I have any friends right now who are, uh, I don't think I have any friends who are seeking out transition. Not that I know of. If they, if they are, they haven't told me. But definitely bullying. Definitely bullying. Uh, the teachers themselves engage in bullying. Not overtly, but I think many of them were subject to very snide comments, rude remarks, very oftentimes sort of like invalidating them if they were, if they were, let's say, um, assigned female at birth but present very masculine or assigned male at birth but present very feminine. So it's just these sorts of little things that add to the, to the existing stresses of being queer in Malaysia already. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. Um, I, th I think we covered so many things like mental health, um, healthcare, education, and also religious conversion therapy. Um, mm. I, I think I have a little bit of comments, huh? religious conversion therapy. I think it's also, okay, so there's this debate. So 
what when someone calls it pseudoscience, the other mm -hmm. one will say this is religious freedom and also mm -hmm. the religious freedom of the person undergoing religious gay conversion to be able to attend such a uh, therapy that is uh, faith-based. What is your okay. reaction to that? Is the constitutional right for people to undergo faith-based uh, conversion therapy and then for example they are provided by the state and then they are optional would you think that this should be allowed people should be allowed to go to faith-based conversion therapy uh yeah that is a prickly subject definitely especially when you throw in the powers of the state you mentioned that this is like state sanction right yeah that's definitely a complicated situation i think people i think if people really want to go because they're denying themselves of their identity like well, we just stop them. But the real issue really arises when you're forcing minors and people who don't have the capacity to consent yet into religious therapy, into religious conversion therapy. So we're talking about kids, we're talking about teenagers who feel pressured by the context around them in order to attend. Sometimes they are even forced to go by their parents, their teachers, so on and so forth. I don't think that should be allowed at all. If a person who's over 18 really wants to go, sure, I guess, like, yes. So, you know, that's your life. But like, especially for children, especially for minors, conversion therapy has been listed. Conversion therapy has been well documented to have so many harms attached to it. Lifelong traumatic experiences that people carry with them for life, you know? And it doesn't work. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't work. Yeah. I agree with you, actually. I think, um... People should be allowed to go for religious-based conversion therapy, but it's been going on for many years. And then I think people are still LGBT in society is a testament that these therapies do not work. And they, the negatives do outweigh the positives, whereby people have long-term post-traumatic stress, like what you say, low self-esteem, mental health issues. I think these are very well documented in psychiatry as well. But um, I think what Jakim said in relation to the opposition Nico Fong mentioned was that um, our religious conversion therapy is very soft. It's very education, awareness, you know, it's about far do I in religious education. And it's not shock therapy, torture, or the associated conventional Western method. So that was the clarification from the other side. I think it was regarding Mukayam, which means uh, camping for three days in Arabic. And it's a consistent program by Jakim in terms of religious um, faith-based re-education for LGBT Malaysians. Yeah, no, um, sure, they can give that excuse. And yeah, maybe we're not living in a 1960s American psychological experiment anymore. But like, when you put these children in a situation where the intention is clear right off the bat, right? And then a uh, religion is such a prickly thing, especially when you're a child. Uh, it's like, oh, yes, it's education. But then you also tell the child that you are going to suffer, you know, eternity in hell if you don't convert out of your wrongful ways. Like, even if it's presented in a nice way, I think that trauma is still going to be bound to the child. And I don't think this is particular. I don't think, and I think it's important to mention that this isn't particularly, I don't think this is attributed to any single religion. I think, and, I, and I've heard, you know, that um, conversion therapy of this sort is uh, implemented across different religions. You know, you name it, there is some sort of like uh, conversion therapy for it. Because like, it's, uh, you know, how, how strong is the religious aspect there that, that you can say it's not polluted by external societal expectations, you know? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think all these are controversial in Malaysia. They are very live issues. So very, in some very, countries, very, 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 they are talking about gay marriage. In Malaysia, it is the right to not have a religious um, conversion therapy. And also, the, I think the right to exist and be recognized in public policy. I think LGBT people are invisible. invisible. So we move on to the next topic. Um, besides issues faced by gay men in Malaysia, what are issues faced by lesbians and bisexuals, transgenders and intersex communities in Malaysia? And then um, maybe I can also give the background. Um, the National Strategic Program for Ending AIDS in 2010 and 2030 highlights uh, transgenders as a target and focus group 
for ending AIDS in Malaysia. So there are apparently 45,000 prostitutes at last count, 2016, 2013. 21,000 of them were females, and the other half, 24,000 of them are transgenders. And besides that, the Suwakam report on transgenders in Malaysia, Suwakam is the Human Rights Commission, in 2019 said that 53% of transgenders are not confident in confiding their gender identity to public healthcare professionals. 39% are arrested by religious authorities or the police for their gender identity. 25 to 29% of the, of, for example, transgender prostitutes in Malaysia are forced to have sex without payment, are robbed, beaten, stripped, extorted, or forced to have unsafe sex without condoms. And 25% has contemplated suicide. 18% have attempted suicide. It goes to show that um, transgender discrimination kills. People who make statements must be really careful. Yes. Oh, yeah, back to you. Yeah, no, I mean, so you've said the facts, you know what I mean? The numbers are there. And um, I will add to that, you know, because I've already spoken about the increased violence and uh, sexual abuse that transgender people face in Malaysia. You know, just adding a little to what you've mentioned, I think some people love to pick and choose facts. So when you started off with, oh, um, this, this, this number of uh, transgender people are sex workers, many people choose not to listen after that. And then they um, they implicate transgender people with moral wrong, saying that you know maybe you deserve the life that you have because you're engaging in sinful acts. But there is no critical thinking behind that statement. Why do transgender people have to resort to um, sexual acts uh, and, and sex work in order to get by? Because they are actively being spurned from society. They do not have an avenue in which to find income, so they resort to the easiest, not easiest, definitely not easiest, but to the only thing they can do, which is self-employment in the form of sex work. Yes. So like, it's these layers of understanding that are missing from society. And this goes beyond queer issues, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking, uh, uh, just, just tangential, sorry to everybody listening. So when we talk about, let's say, very something very uh, contemporaneous to us right now, the COVID-19 issue, when we talk about outbreaks in immigration detention centers, people automatically assume that means migrants have a higher chance of contracting and infecting other people with COVID. No, it's because you rounded them up and put them in crowded detention centers where they spread. It's that sort of like critical thinking that sorely needs to be introduced into Malaysian public discourse regarding all minorities. I think once that there, I think once that, once there is this sort of recognition can we then improve the lives of these minorities, trans people, so on and so forth? Definitely. Um, I think a lot of transgender community people, as, as you mentioned, face a lot of workplace discrimination. They don't get their jobs. They go for interview for five times, 20 times. They don't get their jobs. So what is there else to do to put food on the table, right? Like exactly. yeah. sex work, Correct. sex work. So it's, uh, it's also very sad. I think people should not spurn LGBT people, especially transgender mm -hmm. people, and um, help them to get regular employment, uh, help them have a um, right to dignity and right to life. I think this is very important as well. This is also, I think, Article 10 of the Federal Constitution of Malaysia, right to life and dignity. Um, this, oh, wait, sorry, Article 5, not Article 10, Article 5. <laughs> but yes, going back, I think transgender in Malaysia, Um, I actually look, highly upon, in some ways, um, Noor Sajjad. Noor Sajjad is a famous entrepreneur who is transgender in Malaysia. Um, she's currently hunted by the government, actually, who is uh, yes, residing is. in Thailand. So she was hunted for cross-dressing. She was hunted for also uh, organizing an event wearing a dress and also conducting religious pilgrimage in women's clothing in Saudi Arabia. But on the other side of the coin, I think she is very strong because a lot of women in her position or trans women in, or uh, I'm not very sure of her agenda identity that she self profiles I don't want to drop names here, but um, despite all the challenges that trans women or women have faced in Malaysia, she seems like a successful businesswoman. And um, a lot of women, trans women face discrimination, can't find jobs, they're very poor. So she has crossed that barrier and be um, a sort of a folk hero for transgenders in Malaysia who have a public profile, who's accepted for business profiles. I, I, I think for that part, we should celebrate. 
no sajat. But of course, there's controversy. She's always wearing skimpy clothing and then uh, very undemure and um, against um, strong religious conservative values that are prevalent in Malaysia. I mean, have you heard of yeah. her yourself? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, when I was uh, with Amnesty, we in the in the peak of the controversy that happened with her when she was conducting Umrah in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we, we, we did take a look at that case and we inquired about her just to make sure that she was safe. You know, like, uh, Nur Saja, definitely what she went through and just the level of government persecution. Like, it was ridiculous. They said they mobilized like, what, 200 officers to go search for her across the country for posting a picture of herself on Instagram, um, wearing, uh, wearing women's clothing, conducting Umrah in Saudi Arabia. But, but I will say to what you've added, um, just an alternative point of view. I, I will say that Nur, Nur Saja definitely got off lucky, despite what she's faced. She at least has the funds to be able to relocate to Thailand in order to uh, stay safe from the Malaysian authorities. Most trans people don't have that opportunity. Yeah, so like, you know, it is aspirational in one sense, but on another sense, on another, on, in, on, on the flip side, it shouldn't have to be, you should have to aspire to that level of success before you are given your you know basic rights to live yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i agree and as well the political climate was slightly different under no sajat i think um pakatan harapan came to power in 2018 for 22 okay. months there was actually a new dialogue um i think justice for sisters nisha ayok she was in regular contact with uh, our religious affairs minister, Yusuf Rawa. So that was the first time I saw in Malaysian public, like, you know, a uh, transgender activist standing next to a religious affairs, Islamic religious affairs minister, and talking about dialogue in Malaysian government. So I think that it was against that background, against that background, that No Sajjad had it slightly uh, more of a democratic space to, to express her photos and things like that. That has changed. Because last year, the new, the new Zou, I think it's Zulkifi Al-Bakri, I think he's the new religious affairs minister. He said that I give la full license to all religious police to pursue transgenders in Malaysia. So there's a very sharp change in political tone. Actually, I think the timeline there might be not entirely accurate. Because I remember quite clearly uh, when her controversy first erupted with her on social media, Yusuf Rawa was still religious affairs minister. And he was the one who submitted the complaint against the Malaysia, communi the Malaysia Communications and Multimedia Commission to have her social media taken down. So he was actually the one who instigated this witch hunt against her. Yeah. He actually gave up, I agree with you, he made some conflicting statements. Um, and one yes, he did. Yes, he did. The, the reporter said, oh yeah, LGBT people should have a workplace, free from workplace discrimination, shit like citizens. <sighs> then sometimes they complain. They complain like, um, yeah, what no Sajat do is as contrary. We cannot have LGBT lifestyle in Malaysia. This Malaysia will not tolerate LGBT rights. And I think regarding women's rights as well, I say it was abuse, a misuse of democratic space for LGBT activists to um, have their rally inside the Women's March. Uh, I don't know if you had participated or you have anyone participate. Do you have any comments on what happened in the Women's March that happened? Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at the Women's March. I was at 2020's Women's March, not 2019. But I know that uh, the controversy that rang true for both events, more so 2019, was that <clears throat> was that they were they were they they said that uh, detractors said that the LGBT individuals were taking up space at the Women's March, which is, which is ridiculous. It's, it's just ridiculous. Like, queer women exist, so why shouldn't they be represented as well? You know what I mean? But, yeah. Definitely. Um, okay, so we've been talking about a secular rights-based um, framework towards uh, LGBT rights. So maybe we can talk about more faith-based views in Malaysia. What are some of the yeah. religious uh, positions on LGBT relationships? I mean, it could be all the religions in Malaysia. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, hmm. I, I don't really want to speak for any religion except the one that I grew up with. Uh, I'm honestly not quite familiar with, um, like, uh, Buddhism. People have told me that Buddhism is generally uh, uh, apathetic towards the idea of um, LGBT relations, but I do not know that for sure. Um, I grew up Christian. Um, I grew up Roman Catholic, uh, and. Uh, Catholicism specifically has had 
uh, not the greatest relationship with uh, queer individuals. I mean, at the very least, they're not like burn the witch type of people. But um, uh, I think there have been some attempts made by the Vatican in order to um, promote a message of acceptance. But um, <laughs> it's always clouded by the, oh, but it's still a sin. So very shaky ground that they're standing on there. <laughs> yeah. Same. I think Pope Francis um, asked for greater acceptance for LGBT people in the church, civil partnerships, stopping short of marriage. So that's the position of the Vatican right now. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Buddhist, so maybe I can talk about um, Buddhism or Chinese folk religion. Yeah, I think in um, the comments, maybe our viewers can give some valuable insight. Yeah, definitely. I think the Abrahamic faith, like um, Jewish, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity has a more sin and uh, antagonistic view towards LGBT peoples. But some of the Eastern religions like Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as some of the pagan religions like um, ancient Greek religion, they are more neutral, like you mentioned, neutral to LGBT people. So for example, in like for example, in Chinese folk religion, we actually have a Tu Shen. Tu Shen is like apparently a deity for people who have homosexual relationships. So there's a specific deity in the pantheon of 200 like uh, Buddhist, like Chinese folk religion. There's a deity for homosexual relationships. How much for more acceptance can you get? Um, and also like for, okay, I'm talking about like Malaysian Buddhists who are like Mahayana, so Guan Yin, Guan Yin is like a bodhisattva representation of Buddha. So Guan Yin is portrayed as androgynous. So it doesn't have a gender. So I think a lot of Hindu and Buddhist gods, they don't have genders. So apparently they are the unity of the cosmos, you know, in terms of gender. So that's the kind of positive, empowering third gender um, concepts that we have in Eastern religions. So Guan Yin is androgynous because they are a source of everything. Gender comes after the the birth of the universe. So that's the kind of starting points. Uh. The same goes for this, um, um, yeah, in Mahabharata. Mahabharata is a, um, I don't know, a seminal kind of literature in Indian and Hindu culture, a mix of culture, folklore. I think there are two characters, Shri Kandi. Shri Kandi was born a girl and raised as a man. Later, he went to a Suse, a Yaksha, who exchanged uh, his sex with hers. So she adopted a, a, a man's name and then went on to live a life, a family life, a heterosexual family life. And then the second person, Arjuna. Arjuna is a character from Mahabharata as well. So he himself was trying to refuse sexual advances from another woman. So he became a third gender, a third gender, a kleba, to, to avert the sexual advances. So for one year, he became a woman dressing in women's clothes, teaching like dancing, mystical dancing. And he took on a, a, a trans woman named Brihanala. So we have a lot of positive reinforcements for transgenders um, or people who do not conform to gender identity. What, like what we have mentioned, um, the five genders we have in Bugis culture, we also have in Hindu culture as well, androgynous gods, or also a lot of third gender, gender variances, cross-dressing, changing our genders, transformations in Eastern religions. And maybe the last one I want to mention is Agisdis. Huh? Uh, Agisdis was a deity in Greek mythology, possessing both male and female sexual organs, closely associated with Sibylli. Yep, yep. So these are the more positive ones. Huh? But I also know that um, for the Muslims, the Quran narrates the story of the people of Lot who in, like destroy Lot for the sexual carnal intercourse that they had within each other that was rape. And then there are some hadiths that condemn um, homosexual and transgender act, some amounting to death penalty. So it is still a very controversial subject in Islam, as well as maybe the Old Testament in Christianity and Buddhism, um, Judaism. Yep, yep. Do you have any comments on the Abrahamic part of it? I don't know. I, I think uh, your well, church, I, your church, was it uh, incoming? Was it inclusive to LGBT people? The church that you attended. Uh, my friends knew that I I was queer, which is nice, and they were they were nice with it. But I wasn't gonna let the priest know. <laughs> um, uh, it could have been much worse. I will say that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I so I do, but hearing stories from other people, I do think that I uh, I got lucky. Let's just say that some people uh, have not fared as well as I have in terms of coming into uh, a queer identity uh, whilst being part of uh, a religious 
community. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. What do you think that um, religious societies in Malaysia can do to make religious practice in Malaysia more inclusive? Because I can imagine a lot of LGBT people are religious as well. Some of them want to attend, but they feel a bit apprehensive, not welcome. Do you think this is an issue in Malaysia? Oh yeah, certainly. I think it's an issue everywhere. There are many uh, religious queer people, I'm very certain. Um, you know, the que what was the question? Uh, how can religious institutions make them feel more welcome? Yes, for faith-based LGBT people who want to profess but do not, but yeah, do not feel welcome. Or actually, maybe they are misunderstood and they do not want to be converted in a way that is against their sexual identity. Yeah. But yeah. What can religious institutions do for queer people? Um, <laughs> just leave them alone <laughs> and don't give your unsolicited opinions about their lifestyle. I will say that just uh, you know. Religion is a personal issue, and it should remain a personal issue. Uh, I, I was going to talk about this more later, but if you have, if you as a religious person believe that queer people are sinners, leave, keep that to yourself. <laughs> it's yeah, because like you can change the minds of people who you can't change everybody's minds. You know what I mean? We can't to go into a religious institution and say that and tell everybody that they have to accept queer people that's not realistic and it's not possible but what can what they can do is simply leave people be i think that's just the bare minimum you should be doing yeah yeah i totally agree with you thank you for that yeah i think we move on to our next question huh? so yes. the next question is how can religious conservatism public religious sentiments coexist with LGBT rights in Malaysia. How do you address like conservative people who are against public LGBT rights in Malaysia who think that LGBT rights should be kept to yourself in the same way you imagine they have to keep their personal belief and religion to themselves. Let me give an example of religious conservatism. In 2011, I think we had sexuality Madeka, it's a sexual reproductive rights, um, community-based <sighs> festival that has arts, drama, workshops. They had it running for three years. I think Punky Tech uh, launched that, but um, it stopped by, it was a police ban that stopped it. it um, and the high court enforced the ban. And in 2013, uh, the Court of Appeal also affirm the ban so we do not have um, lgbt festival in a kind of community sense with gender workshops that we used to have in 2011 and also like there's a conservative politician um an opposition leader who is president of amno zahid hamidi he said the palu earthquakes of indonesia happened because there was a thousand people who were practicing the lgbt lifestyle do, uh, we must reject the LGBT lifestyle in Malaysia and prevent the fate of an earthquake in Malaysia. What, what do you do uh, with people who have such views and then they amplify in parliament and goes on hands up? Yeah. Sorry. Um, what's notable about the examples you brought up is that these were people in positions of power. So going back to what I was saying earlier about bigoted people always going to be in existence. Be big yeah, bigots are always going to be in existence, but your bigotry should be separate from your power. I.e. how that connects to religious conservatism is that it should not in any way interfere with the exercise of state power. So when you talk about the uh, discontinuation of the fest of the Sexuality Merdeka Festival, they could only do that because they had state mechanism at their hands to be able to do that. So you already recognize power imbalance right off the bat. Queer people would never have had uh, access to state power in order to um, enact the actions that they wanted. They couldn't, you know? So it is my firm belief that uh, religion should be kept separate from the state. Yeah, so even if you are a conservative, even if you are a, even if you are a conservative, whatever you believe, that should never interfere with the exercise of state power. Yeah, yeah. 
I agree with what you say. Um, I think that people who have religious personal beliefs should not impose their views on um, or interfere with the human rights of other people because they are living everyday lives and they are affected by your religious views. Hence, you know, Pride and Prejudice, the title of the show, are like when you have a prejudice against someone and society amplifies that as a collective against an individual, that might be injustice. But you know, I'm, I'm sorry, it stingles in my mind. What is your message to people who are watching who do not agree with LGBT rights who are watching this today? They, they, they think that um, LGBT people should be punished and should not be embraced. I don't have a message, honestly. I don't. I choose not to engage these people. I don't think it's productive in any way to engage these people, because when you talk about um, when you when you talk about changing public perceptions regarding uh, a queer people, uh, there needs to be. If I'm speaking at you about why I think queer people should be given rights, but you are not in a position to listen to me, or you refuse to listen to me, or listen to what I have to say, then there is no use for me to speak to you. Uh, yeah, there is there is simply no use for me to speak to you. I'm wasting my energy. You're wasting your time standing in in, in front of me. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I actually I was gonna say something about this actually. So like when you talk about wanting to change people's minds, there will always I, like I said already, like there will always be bigotry in some form. Uh, if it's not the queer community, it's refugees, it's drug users. It's, it, you know, it's some community will always be stigmatized somehow or other, and people will use whatever excuse they have at their disposal to be able to justify this bigotry. So yes. when it's against the queer community, the common justification for this bigotry is um, religious conservatism. But I, think, uh, but I think assessing bigotry solely through the lens of religious conservatism is not necessarily uh, productive. Like I said, religion is a personal belief. And then when, when we say religious conservatism is the main problem, we are taking the fight for we are taking the fight for queer liberation to an individual level, which like I said, is not productive because you can never change each and every single person's mind. The conversation should just be keep bigotry out of uh, keep bigotry out of power, keep power and bigotry separate. Because if you want to, we can talk on and on about how religious conservatism, oh, it is regressive and so on and so forth. But challenging an individual belief at that level is an unwinnable battle. Because at the end of the day, it is a belief and it doesn't require debate or rigorous intellectual exercise to justify. People believe what they believe. And you should be allowed to believe what you believe, don't care, so long as you do not have the power to make sure, you, so long as you do not have the power over my employment, over my housing, over my uh, my medical services, you know, I, I think that's where the conversation needs to be shifted. You know, fixating on oh, religious people, it's it does nothing for us. Yep, I can imagine. I mean, you talk about the history of bigotry. It has always been like against um, black people. It has been always against. Uh, by the way, uh, endure three hundred years of slavery, and then uh, it was always. Women, women who only got the right to vote, and like maybe fifty years, hundred years ago, and then um, LGBT people currently. So I mean, we had a history of bigotry. So I think the message is to always get the majority to listen out and hear out and treat people who are different as human beings, despite their strong or personal opinions. Because some of their personal opinions, when amplified, has a real effect on individual lives, like you mentioned, in healthcare, housing, and education, and all comprehensive part of life. And then I'll move on to the next question as well. Um, okay, the state of LGBT agenda in Malaysia. How can grassroots activists and allies and the LGBT community better organize in Malaysia? Considering the past 10 years, how will the next 10 years be? How can cisgender straight people better support their LGBT friends? Because I'm going to pluck out a statistic. Um, in 2013, the Pew's Research in America, they did a Pew's Research of uh, Social Attitudes with LGBT in Malaysia. In 2013, 83% were against um, accepting LGBT people in society, only 9% accepted. This has changed remarkably, I think, today. I don't have the statistics, but a change of government, um, a public um, kind of political milieu that's against corruption, that is for good governance, that has seen like emergencies, has turned politics on its head. So I think LGBT rights, you know, has been always 
been a smoke screen and then it should be coming out front and center in the next decade soon. How can we prepare our grassroots activists or allies, LGBT community to organize better? Okay. Okay, I think you asked me two questions in there. So how can queer, how can activist organizations organize better and how can um, people who don't belong in the LGBT community, uh, how can they be a better allies? I'll answer yeah. the first one first. Um, Local conditions are applying as well. <laughs> wow, it's caveated. Um, I do think that, I think that for LGBT activist organizations to be able to move forward, um, there, there needs to be, um, what I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? There needs to be a shift and there needs to be adaptation to changing social conditions and changing um, perceptions, not just about queer people, but about activism as a whole, right? So yes. about 10 years ago, the conversation was, oh, I think the conversation centered around um, things like gay marriage, um, uh, gay, uh, a, gay, a gay marriage, uh, what else? Representation in mass media, so on and so forth. But the time for that conversation has long passed. We are already seeing the advent of such um, implementations being, you know, they, we are seeing more queer characters in our media. Uh, gay marriage has been legalized in many, many, many countries. Taiwan being the first Asian country to do so. But once we get to that point, we now see that there is still a long way to go. So how do queer organizations adapt with the times by being, they have to be more prospect, prospective. They have to look forward, aim higher. So what I mean by this is, I think a lot of queer organizations in Malaysia, uh, if they haven't already done, not to discredit anyone, they have to be definitely more intersectional in their thinking. What I mean by this is not just having representation on, uh, based on membership and organization, but having specific concerns about uh, different communities highlighted. So there needs to be a race analysis. There needs to be a class analysis. Uh, upper class Chinese men, uh, an upper class Chinese gay man living in Sri Hartamas, living in Mount Kiara, does not face the same challenges as, you know, um, as a B40 working gay man uh, who's Indian. There are very different dynamics in play here. And I think that queer liberation on the basis of interpersonal relationships and purely based on the notion of acceptance, which was the conversation in the last decade, the life expectancy of that conversation is coming to an end. I, I think we need to move ahead and we need to re we need to introduce more radical ideas into our queer activism. It's not just about celebrating one gay kiss you see on TV. It's about knowing the needs of the community because it's all about intersectionality. If you think about it, all activism is interrelated. Refugee, there are LGBT refugees as well. There are LGBT uh, drug users. These communities all intersect. There needs to be comprehensive analysis that takes into account different minority groups then can you move forward as for the second question how can uh you know non-lgbt people non-queer people be better allies just give queer people a space to be heard yeah. i think it's as simple as that listen to them and give them the space to be heard because that's the problem but that's that's been the problem queer people have had space robbed from them they aren't they aren't um represented in positions of power they aren't represented in, in in government they aren't even there to make decisions for their own community it's always been somebody else legislating for them there needs to be in and in organizations if you're running a queer organization make sure that you know your organization caters to and properly addresses and has somebody on the board who is you know of the identity that you are fighting for don't be it's it's not white saviorism <laughs> it shouldn't yes. be. Yeah. yeah. I like two points that you made just now. Um, the first one is that you must be more radical in the sense we need to be more ambitious coming in the next 10 years because we see gay representation in the media and then that's not translating to everyday folk 
LGBT folk who do not have this openness or appreciate this human rights. They don't get the benefit. And then the second part also, like you need to, for LGBT, you mentioned intersectionality. I think what has been missing in the movement in Malaysia is intersectionality. So women, LGBT, Black Lives Matter, even Palestinian Lives Matter. So, I mean, different causes must unite. So yeah. human rights for one person is human rights for all people. So you must recognize that everyone's human rights are important. No community is small enough. So that's what you mentioned. And I think that's a very good point. I think people have been working in silos. So I, I like this British film. It's called Pride in 2014. So there were striking miners in Wales. So the government wanted to shut down their mines. So they organized and they didn't organize alone. They organized with help from labor, miners, uh, sorry, the miners, the Welsh miners organized with help from the LGBT community who came together yeah. and protested together. And with that, they saved their mind. So, I mean, that's the same how it applies in Malaysia. <clears throat> to organize, you need to reach out beyond your community, engage different sections. So, I mean, you mentioned the stereotypical upper class and then the different um, lower class in Sabah or Kelantan might experience different discrimination. But in terms of yeah. the political process, going through the process, we need to have a bigger, broader umbrella so that we, so the, 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 the power and the interest that aligns can become the majority in parliament. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, there's both a little bit things are going on there as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, the, I think something that you mentioned very, you mentioned that I think has to be repeated is uh, a lot of activism is done in silos. And I don't think that's, uh, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's ill intention on the part of uh, activist groups. It's uh, it's definitely I, I, the thought process is always we don't want to step on their shoes. We should give them space. But like there is a way to be there is a way to provide space to like other communities, but still work together. You know what I mean? So it doesn't have to be the six degrees of separation. Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to have more LGBT representation in civil society in Malaysia. I think that was legal democratic in Malaysia. So they they were an original group and then they spawned actually new democratic society. So that's how it started. It, it branched out. So maybe, and also I see a lot of uh, new young activists that are queer, LGBT activists, maybe in UD18, maybe in different places. I think young activists who are not millennials, who are probably Generation Z, they are stepping up the plate. And I think more of them must come forward. And then I see them in these young societies, they, they might flourish. And then because of the network effects of collaborating, coming from the same place and collaborating, I think that's a very good culture we must amplify moving forward. Right. Yeah, no, that's entirely correct. No, I, I, can't, end this, I can't end this session without um, promoting the organization that I am part of. Uh, yes. Shout out to Missy Solidarity. Shout out to Missy Solidarity on um, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I would say that they're a youth organization, like you said, Gen Z led, who doesn't come with the baggage of how we, how, how us older uh, millennials, millennials, how, how millennial activism works. Millennial activism, I would say is very like, oh, gay group, gay group, um, indigenous rights groups, indigenous rights groups, everything is segmented. Everything is siloed, you know, with these newer groups, um, with the one I'm part of, Missy Solidarity, in case you didn't hear it, uh, press, you know, they address all kinds of issues and they do it effectively, they do it well. They, do. Yeah, so I think that that is the way forward. And it's in their name, solidarity amongst all communities, amongst all oppressed communities. Yep. Guys, listen up, Missy Solidarity, check them out on social media. And uh, we're moving to our final question soon. If anyone has yes. any further comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section. So um, our next question is, what do you think the private sector and the Malaysian government should do from today to improve LGBT rights in Malaysia? What is the timeline? And also, if gay marriage is a benchmark and what's beyond that, does that apply in Malaysia? Sure. Um, I think the answer for this is very simple. Queer people aren't asking for the queer people aren't asking for the world. Queer people aren't asking for a million and one changes. Queer people aren't asking for special treatment, not a mon non monetary policy or all that. If the government is serious about improving the lives of the LGBT community, repeal all your oppressive laws. Recognize LGBT people as having equal status to 
any other regular citizen recognize gender identity, do not criminalize uh, different sexual orientations. Um, you know, and you talk about, uh, Dom Dominic, you talked about gay marriage. Let's aim like further than that, you know what I mean? Because marriage is just a symbolic thing. Let's talk about inheritance rights for, uh, let's talk about like, yeah, inher like stuff like being able to take care of a child and being able to have the state acknowledge uh, uh, queer parents, you know, um, being able to even small things like having a healthcare policy that caters to your partner, even though you, if, to your queer partner, you know what I mean? It's stuff like that. Stuff, just acknowledge the rights, just acknowledge the rights of people to be able to live in society. It's not much. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I 100% agree. Government must not discriminate against their citizens especially because of being LGBT, they deserve to be equal citizens before the law, they deserve equal protection. Yeah, not asking for much, not asking for more money, just equal protection. Um, I think as well, I, for my personal belief, I think the private sector should step up their plate. Um, I think right, big yeah. private <laughs> companies, like, you know, I understand if GLCs, government companies can't do it because it's against national policy. But if you have private sector Chinese companies who are very progressive, they should have like uh, diversity <laughs> training. They should have non-discrimination, employment interviews. I mean, these are the things, if they can't say we support LGBT rights, private sector companies who are large must say that we are a diversity employer and we provide inclusion training, um, not just for LGBT people, refugees, minorities, black people, anyone who is oppressed or marginalized. And if anyone's looking for resources, I think Stonewall in the UK, they provide uh, multinationals in Malaysia, diversity training, for them improve their, the way they handle equality and uh, to prevent, actively prevent discrimination in their uh, companies. So I think next step, definitely companies must uh, do something about LGBT inclusion. And uh, one, one last point that uh, you mentioned about, yeah, let's aim further than gay marriage. I mean, I'm going to ask you about your opinion, your personal opinion on that, but let's say it's Singapore, <laughs> like Singapore. Singapore is a progressive country, quote unquote, uh, but they still have they... Section 377 on the books. Like they yes, don't they do. Even, yeah, so exactly. They are more progressive than Malaysia in some ways, but they are very regressive in other ways. Uh, what do you think um, about that? Like Singapore being more progressive, less progressive, but they still have like 377 on the books and yeah you know, this if this is our last point like i think it's a very good question if this is the last thing we're going to cover um i don't think we should i don't think we should confuse economic development with progress i think just because queer people there have a better standard of living i think just because queer people are allowed to flourish in um the very capitalistic society that singapore is doesn't mean that there is the doesn't denote the absence of oppression it may just take very different forms um so i will say that you know that and this goes back to intersect this goes back to intersectionality the class aspect we see singapore as this beautiful city state What's actually happening under that veneer of beauty and progress? We don't, you know, there is, I'm sure there's more to the story. And you know what, like I can substantiate that with a story. Um, uh, I think about last, late last year, um, a group of uh, transgender students were protesting outside of NUS, I think National University of Singapore, I can't remember, or was it a government building? I can't remember, I'm sorry. And it was just it was just six students, six people holding up signs. Police were sent to arrest each and every single one of them just for asking for better treatment from their university. So is this really progress or is it just economic or is it just like economic progress in a very capitalistic notion that masks the injustices that lie beneath? Can you re uh, repeat the small part as uh, they, was it regarding a university? You were making yes. a point. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sorry if I wasn't clear. Yes, uh, because their university was uh, mistreating them, I can't remember in what form, but I think they were being um, 
just uncooperative and hostile towards uh, trans students specifically. So a small protest was held, less than 10 people, and police were called in. The number of police outnumbered the number of protesters by, I think, double. Like, you know, so it's not as progressive as we think it is. Yes, just yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it ties up to today's topic as well. Pride and Prejudice, this, is there space uh, for LGBT discourse and uh, rights in Malaysia? I think we might have a slightly bigger democratic space. So that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, you mentioned also, I think people, the police outnumber the protesters. I've even seen single men protesters and they were... They were, I think, fine for causing a riot or fine for, for illegal protests. I mean, I never heard of single man protests being um, illegal assembly. So it happens in Singapore. So I mean, I mean, they are progressive in the sense that a lot of them studied um, in higher level. They are exposed to different cultures. I think they are the most multicultural country in Asia. One of the most, um, although they are a small country, and then they are more slightly more Western educated, but. In the other sense, in terms of democratic rights, they're very controlled. Like, they cannot protest in the streets. One person protests get regulated. Even if you go on Facebook and type something, they actually have something called a POFMA Act. So they get a Facebook to, to, to go after you, and then you must retract your statement and apologize. It's a micromanage, and traditionally, people associate that with a nanny state. So Malaysia has more space. I mean, like, it depends. I mean, if a Malay man was having this conversation, me and you today, in Basa, Malaysia, yes, I think... It might be very controversial, but it, it, considering we are speaking in English, and then the fact that we are talking in a very like community setting rather than a more activist <laughs> like street protest setting, I think some people will let us have this alternative view. So I think it's also like in Malaysia, they cater, the government caters to different communities and treat different communities with different leeways. I, th I think this is not really like Singapore is slightly more micromanaged. Yes. Definitely. And um, yep, yep, yep. Um, before we move on to the Q&A session, if anyone has any questions, you might leave them in the comment section now. Yep. So, oh, I see a comment. Um, sex education in Malaysia by Sean is focusing more on abstinence and contraception and the bad consequences of doing it. What do you say? I think that's a completely fair assessment of sex education. In fact, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's even, I, I think even saying that contraception is part of the conversation is very generous. I think a lot of it has to do with abstinence. It's just abstinence. It's, it's, it's just abstinence and it's just fear mongering. If you get pregnant, uh, if you, if you get pregnant, your, your entire life is ruined. Uh, single mothers don't do any teen single mothers don't have lives, uh, you will be miserable forever, which is both um, silly and also uh, incredibly misogynistic. Um, so yeah, like it, it, it's pretty clear to notice that there is these underlying prejudices that inform so much of our policy. You know, like even in the most generous reading, you can assume that they have good intentions, but the effect is detrimental. Yes. Um, to our next question uh, uh, by Wai Ming. Yeah, I think a rebuttal to Jakim's response of ours is not a shock therapy is that physical abuse is not the only source of trauma, but an invalidation of someone's gender identity uh, can be just as bad of trauma. Also with the lack of transparency because the government don't discuss these issues with an open mind or in public. It's really hard to know what goes on in the government's mind. Yeah, I have no comments. Why Ming? Why Ming's mind? <laughs> Shout out to Why Ming. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lack of transparency, even really. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a fair statement. I don't have much to add to it. Yeah. Okay. What steps can individuals take to shape atti uh, attitudes and discourse on equality among conservative people in Malaysia? Yes. Like oh. I mentioned just now, right? 83% disapprove of homosexuality. So having a conversation to some people might feel like it's a privilege, although for other people, it's their human right, it's their dignity, it's their right to life. Yes. I will say that if you are in a position and you feel confident enough and strong enough in your conviction to speak, um, you, you should, you should. Um, what steps can individuals take? 
there aren't many steps I would say. I would say get that conversation out there because oftentimes the perpetuation of stigma happens is because people just refuse to acknowledge it or they just people like if your relatives made some really bigoted comment, people just let it slide, you know, but it's important to address these when they arise. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In your own personal capacity, I would say that that's the one of the best things you can do. Do you think it's useful for religious organizations to have uh, dialogues with uh, LGBT rights advocacy groups? I think it's useful if you are willing to actually listen, but if you are going, if you are showing up to a discussion um, with a premeditated opinion in mind, and you're not willing to actually listen or take things into consideration, uh, don't bother showing up. You, you are wasting everyone's time. Okay. Um, moving on to another comment. I think the origins of Buddhist concepts contain a lot of LGBTQ context. Same with other religions like Hinduism, Islam, if I'm not mistaken. But some of the followers are indoctrinated with notions of sexual minorities and gender identities are not natural. What do you do? You have any comments about? So what he's trying to say maybe is that um, religion does not preach discrimination against LGBT people, but the people who are administering religion makes it so and calls them not natural. And I think there's always going to be this tension between those who are literalists who read the Old Testament by the book and those who are more purposive and more like, you know, we, we, we must have love thy neighbor, love your mankind. So, I mean, there's going to be this tension between the overall purpose and including uh, making religion more inclusive and people who are backwards and more progressive. This tension will always be here. Yo, no, I, I think you're entirely correct in that assessment uh, because... Religious, religion is religion is nothing if it weren't for followers. Religion is just words on a religion. Are, religion is just words in a book if it weren't for followers. So to say that religion preaches one thing versus followers do the other is just um, I wouldn't go as far as to say it removes accountability, but I do think that as a person who is giving life to uh, abstract concepts on a book, you have a responsibility to assess your faith and how you practice it instead of being beholden to a text. Who has, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I think, the, I think that excuse of, um, I can't question it, it's just how it was written, um, that I don't think that excuse flies because you are the person who is manifesting that religion, religious belief, you are actualizing it and making it into a reality. You have a responsibility to do the right thing with those beliefs, with those words, yeah. Yeah, you made a very good point. Um, the next question, is that Damien Chong? <laughs> oh, oh it's, uh, it's the social media handle for your Instagram and Twitter. Yes. Right? Shout out to me already. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have any final comments before we wrap up today's session? They... Brian. <laughs> um, hang on. Uh. Let me just look at something first. So the original topic of this is that the original like tagline for this event is Pride and Prejudice. Is there a space for LGBT rights and discourse in Malaysia? I think as a final comment to answer that question, if there is no space, make that space. That space doesn't exist until you fight for it. And that goes with any form of activism whatsoever. The space will never readily present itself to you and you will, there will be pushback in any form of activism. Activism is not smooth sailing. Activism is never smooth sailing. Uh, you know, if you believe in the cause, you have to fight for it. Yep, I agree with you. Definitely, that there is no best time. I mean, we should start today. Um, with that, I would like to share some resources for LGBT communities in Malaysia who want to learn more about the movement and uh, let legal advice. Uh, we have Justice for Sisters and SIT Foundation. They address LGBT, especially transgender women uh, who get locked up and they need legal advice. And 
Um, we have the Palangi campaign. We have Sexuality Madeka. So that's a Facebook group. There's Pink Triangle Foundation for LGBT Healthcare, PLU Penang, uh, Gay Straight Alliance, Kota Kinabalu, and also an online resources like Queer Lapis. Um, also, you can check out Instagram, uh, Miko Fong. I post a few infographics as well. So um, thank you for joining us today, Brian. It has been thank a you for pleasure. Having me. Thank you. I hope to have Likewise. more conversations with you again. I hope the Malaysian community opens up and talks more about LGBT rights. I'll see you soon. Take care. You too. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you, everyone. Please follow all of us on social media. Don't make one weekend show, Facebook page. Follow Brian Chia. Follow me. And I'll see everyone <laughs> soon. Hey. The stream over. No. Yeah, <laughs>